This is the Constitution of Belize. And matter of fact, we are planning on uh, offering these pretty soon also. Uh, um, but that's another story. The first paragraph, for those that have never heard it, when I read this, it really touched me, brought tears to my eyes. This is what it says. Belize Constitution. Whereas the people of Belize affirm that the nation of Belize shall be founded upon principles which acknowledge the supremacy of God, faith in human rights and fundamental freedoms, the position of the family in a society of free men and free institutions, the dignity of the human person and the equal and inalienable rights with which all members of the human family are endowed by their creator. That's what we believe in our country. What is inalienable rights? There are rights that cannot be sold. They cannot be bartered. They cannot be given away. You can't even give away your inalienable rights. You cannot alienate them from your body from yourself. You cannot sell yourself into slavery in Belize. You cannot because your freedom is inalienable. God gave you those basic rights and no man can take it. So when Belizeans are accepting $50, $100, $25, pay my rent, give me a sheet of zinc, give me a a, a thing of sand for their vote, Belizeans are selling themselves cheap. The reality is, the rights that they have, they can't even sell it. It's not theirs to sell. Your life was given to you by God, but you don't have the authority under God's law to take your life. It's the same thing. It's inalienable. These are basic rights that you have. And that's what our nation believes. Now I challenge you to help us educate our people and show them what this is. When they can understand what this really means, then our people can stop selling themselves, like a guy said, for the hundred, for the blue bill, he calls it. Okay? When they understand what they have. And Belizean Americans and Belizeans abroad, you don't need to be empowered. You have the power. You don't need anybody to give you the power to impact your country. You have it. When you go to the store, and they mistreat you and you walk away and say, I'm not buying here anymore. You speak through the power of your pocketbook. You have the same power because your pocketbook really and truly runs Belize. So when you're out here thinking, when the prime minister or a minister of government shows up and you go and try and get your picture for your photo op, he should be the one begging for a photo op with you. Not you begging for a photo op with him. And I also challenge Belizeans abroad. Belizeans abroad are quick to be gullible and accept trash brought to them from politicians in Belize. And Belizeans don't do their homework to see what the reality is on the ground. You need to do your homework. Because when you are treating these people like kings, they are back home raping our country. See, there is a major problem to me. It's like I, I was looking at this thing they have now on Coronel or General Antonio Nariño, who was the guy that helped to free Colombia from Spain. Okay? Now, in Belize, we are no longer, we are, no, we are not under Spain, there's a 10th of September. We are not under England, there's a 21 September. But there's a problem. The same colonial spirit 
that was used to rule our people like slaves have been maintained and enshrined in the way the government is ran. That the only way to change it is to amend our constitution. There is no other way to change it. The ministers of government on television will tell you, we have the anything we say or do, we do it because we have, how did I explain it? Uh, 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 they have a mandate, in other words, to do whatever they do. And they have the authority from the people. So when you put somebody there, they can change any laws they want because they believe they're doing it for the people. They are the rep for the people. That's what it's supposed to be. It's not the truth. And I'm going to get into that. I was going to wait a little bit, but I need to jump into that right quick so you could understand. Let me explain to you how Belize really operate. And I will end this by the time we have to end it. Let me explain how it works. This is my proposal. And this proposal has not been released but to you folks in Houston. And I will be in Belize very soon. And it will be on every website uh, that we have. And it will, be a, it will be in the news media. It will be out there uh, when I get there. So when this thing is released, um, this will be the first release of this right here. Okay? So here we go. Give the people the power and the voice. Amend section 69 of the Constitution. Let me first explain to you. Section 69 is the section of the Constitution that gives the power of the National Assembly to be able to amend the Constitution. Okay? All right. Whereas the Constitution of Belize does not provide for the direct input of the people of Belize where amendments to it are concerned. And whereas section 69 of the Constitution of Belize states that the National, the National Assembly may alter any of the provisions of this Constitution. And whereas this section of the Constitution authorizes any government administration which has the support of three quarters majority, majority of all the members of the House to amend any portion of our Constitution, and whereas Section 69.5a calls for the support of a simple majority of the Senate for Part 2 of the Constitution to be amended, and whereas most government administrations will automatically have a simple majority of the Senate, seeing that Section 61 of the Constitution gives the Prime Minister the power to appoint half of the Senate. Six of the twelve Senators is appointed by the Prime Minister of the day. And the President of the Senate does not have to come from the Senate, can come from outside. He or she is also appointed by the Prime Minister. They always have a simple majority. So, Whereas the senators are not elected by the people of Belize. Now, Senator Gordon, I respect him a lot. And we've been on many, on, well, uh, uh, channel, it was Krem TV, they were together, and we've spoken, and, um, and he has been fighting against both Eighth and Ninth Amendment. Um, and, uh, but he says, and many people think, uh, but I believe that the majority is against what's being said, but that, um, well, because the people elect the government, then consequently that means that they also elect the senators. See, when you elect, you make the red the majority, then you're saying the red leader will choose six people to be senators, and the blue leader will choose three. And then there will be one from the church, one from the union, and one from commerce, or the business community. I say when you elect people to go there to be in government, in the house, you did not have any earthly idea who they were going to put there in the Senate. 
So I really believe that we need to have an elected Senate. But that's another story. That's been pushed, and the majority of the people that voted, voted for an elected Senate in the last administration. But it wasn't given because there was a threshold according to our laws. Although it's the majority of the voters, it didn't meet the threshold. Do you understand? So you out here can understand this thing easily because guess what? In America, how do we live? We have an elected Senate and an elected Congress. Not just that. In America, for you to amend the Constitution, you must have a two-thirds majority of the House, two-thirds majority of the Senate, not the, not the President. The House, the Senate, and three-fourths of all states must ratify that amendment or it will not become law. In Belize, however, this is how it works. We don't have a separation as it should be. We have a prime minister who under Amendment 3 basically now overpowers and controls the legislature because the people that are in the cabinet can no longer speak out against their leader. When they have come to a meeting, a decision in cabinet, when they get to the house, they better support it. And I am told by a member of this administration, cabinet, that when they go to cabinet, the reality is that most of the time, that again, that's what I was told, when if the PM says something, guess what? That's what it's going to be. I mean, think about it. If you don't agree with me and I'm PM, you won't be working long. I'll replace you. Because there's another person who is just considered an area rep who got voted for also, but is getting paid less because he's not in cabinet. So I can replace you quickly with him or her if you don't do what I tell you. So that's how you overpower people. So basically the executive controls the legislature. And therefore we have another separation. We have the judiciary. But I have a word for you people. The prime minister is now appointing the judiciary. So, who controls it all? You don't have a democracy. This is not a democracy. And if we want a class of democracy, I can give that later on. But it's not a democracy. But let's continue. Basically, what I'm proposing here, therefore, is this. We hereby propose that section 69 of the Constitution of Belize be amended to give the voice and power to the people of Belize by requiring that, one, a bill to alter any section or provision of the Constitution shall not be regarded as passed by the House of Representatives unless on its final reading in the House the bill is supported by the votes of not less than two-thirds of all the members of the House. Whoa. But Mr. Menzies, hold on. Right now it's three-fourths. Why are you dropping it? You'll know why. I'm saying two-thirds for anything. Two-thirds. Number two. A bill to alter any section of prov or provision of this Constitution shall not be regarded as passed by the National Assembly unless it is supported by the votes of not less than two-thirds of the Senate. You see, we only had two-thirds or three-fourths majority of the House, and then a simple majority of the Senate. Not anymore. Two-thirds of the Senate must agree. And here is the catch-22. This is where our people get their voice. A bill, number three, to alter any section or provision of this Constitution shall not become law or an amendment to the Constitution unless it is ratified, ratified by the votes of not less than three-fourths of every city, town, and village council in our country. Therefore, our people will have a voice. How does this work? A voted upon in a secret ballot in each city, town, and village council, and 
in which not less than three quarters of the members of the council or board must vote and which must be supported by the votes of not less than three quarters of the board or council and held after an obligated 90 day consultation period and during which at least three consultations must be held in each and every constituency in the country and consultations must be attended by at least three quarters of every village, town, and city council in our country of that particular jurisdiction. So what am I saying in layman's terms? You're not going to amend the constitution ever again unless three-fourths of our people. No, not the guys you put there. This is what was explained. And I'm going to show it to you how, how crazy the idea is. It's simple. If we voted for the pink party because we wanted all cars to be painted pink, when they get in there, they have a mandate to paint all cars pink. You agree? That's why we voted for them, right? Now, can they turn around and say, we will now paint all houses pink because the people told us to do so? Can they do that? No. Because that's not what they ran on. They ran on painting cars pink. They can't come and say, now we'll paint all pigs yellow. They can't do that. But that's what they're doing. They're saying we have a mandate. You're out of your mind. Your mandate is not to do the craziness you're doing. With that mandate, they're trying to pass preventative detention. Yes, um, Amendment 8. I'm, I'm only covering one small part. It's, it's, it's pretty deep, but um, some parts were pushed in and slammed into us. It's already in effect. Amendment 8, <laughs> some parts of it, it's already in effect. Um, but anyway, um, this part, which is the, the most detrimental part of it, we were able to block. And it says this, under a law which makes reasonable provision in the interest of public safety, peace and good order, for the preventative detention of persons who are suspected to belong to criminal gangs or to have otherwise been associated with criminal activity. Now you and I know that in Belize there's a problem with gang activity. We know that. But I think we're smart enough to also know that the problem can be resolved overnight. And you may think I'm nuts. But I can tell you if you've been paying attention to the news our Prime Minister just flew back and avoided a special inauguration ceremony to go back and deal with the gangs. What country do prime minister or presidents go and deal with gangs? Only in Belize. That's another story for another time. Anyway, if you are suspected to belong to a gang, or if you are suspected to have been otherwise associated with criminal activity, this applies to you. It also applies to you, paragraph L, under a law which makes reasonable provision for the protection of children from criminal conduct or other antisocial behavior. What is that saying? That is saying that if you have, an example given to me by a member of this government, said, Mr. Menzies, there was a situation in Dangriga where this husband died, the lady was single, she was drinking or something like that, she was a drunk, and she had a kid. The government took away the kid for the protection of the child. Because, if you think about it, that is, remember now, antisocial behavior. Now, who determines what antisocial behavior, behavior is? And by the way, you know what happened to that kid? The kid was given to a foster family who beat the kid to death. Fact, not fiction. Okay? So, who decides what antisocial behavior is? I've been on 27 buses in Belize, talking to people and educating them about the 8th and 9th Amendment. I'm antisocial. I'm anti-government according to them. So I can be detained under this. You see, these things are not created just to be created. There are reasons for them. Now, the idea they said is that, well, 
Let me tell you what happens if you fall under this. What's going to happen to you? No person shall be detained under a detention order, under a law referred to in paragraph K for a period longer than 21 days. I didn't say arrested, I said detained. Catch 22. But the initial detention order may be extended for a period not exceeding one month by a judge in the Supreme Court in chambers and an ex parte application made on that behalf. What am I saying? What I'm saying is you will be detained if you're suspected to belong to a gang. If your child lives in your home, but you're now watching your 17-year-old uh, bad egg nephew who is a brat and he has antisocial behavior, he sometimes messes with the gang or whatever, they're going to come into your house and take away your kids. You have an 11-year-old, a 15-year-old, and a 3-year-old. They are now associated with antisocial behavior. So to protect your kids from that other person, they will take your kids and detain them and keep them. 21 days initially could be extended up to an extra month. That's 52 days. And how will that happen? Well, when they pick you up, you can't call home. You have no right to an attorney. All those rights given to you in the Constitution of Belize will be taken away. Listen carefully. Those rights remain for the guy that actually commits the crime. But they don't remain for the guy that suspected that he will commit a crime. So if you don't commit a crime, you have no rights. If you commit a crime, you have rights. If you don't commit a crime, you don't have an attorney. If you commit a crime, you can get an attorney. If you don't commit a crime, you can't call home. You commit a crime, and it's a teenager, a kid, they can call home. So, that's how reasonable our country is now. So 21 days you're detained. Then, they go to a judge. In chambers, meaning private. You have not spoken to an attorney. You haven't spoken to mama, husband, brother, sister, nobody. Nobody knows where you are. You're just missing. You are missing. That's all. They don't have to tell you where you are. Where anybody, they don't have to tell anybody where you are. And neither do they have to tell you why you were picked up. You don't need to be read your rights because you weren't arrested. You were only detained. And then what they will do is add an extra month after you talk to a judge in private. Judge, Johnny came over here. He, we believe this guy is a serious gang member. Now this gal is a serious gang member and she's a detriment to society. Can you give me another month? Sure. Sign off. The judge doesn't know who you are. And by the way, let me give you, tell you the other side. You know the police officer, sergeant, told me in Orange Walk? He said, I don't know what you guys are talking about. We've been using this. I said, we said, yeah. So we pick people up, hold them for the 72 hours, have them walk outside and bring them right back in again. So we've been doing this. Let me tell you something. I got a text when I was here a few weeks ago from somebody that I know well, a, Be a Belizean diaspora member that's back home who was beat up by the police. He was creating a program for Belizeans who go back, who had been detained here, so they had to go back and do time. When they get out, he was creating a program for them. I don't know why they picked him up, but they beat him bad. Guess what? If they can beat you bad now, and bring you back in so no one can see your bruises. Because what they do is they beat you in your stomach. So that there is no bruise. How many times can you be beaten in 52 days? That broken arm will have healed in 52 days. Healed wrong, but healed. Folks, if that's what you want for your country, then be silent. Be silent. Don't worry about it. That's Amendment 8. Uh, I need to read this because it's, it's very... It's brief, but, but it's... Um, I gotta read the wording, okay? I can't just say it. What? I mean, the eight? No, nine. Nine. I already did it. It's okay, nine. But you, I think you had like just a wrap up statement on eight, didn't you? No? Yeah, well, 
Yeah, but 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 it's just, the statement is here. So okay, so just, right. just let me let me let me pull it up. Amendment nine. Yeah. And I had it here, but I know what I was messing with other things. Right. Okay. Let's wrap up eight and move. Just, to just, just let me, let me, let me just yeah, explain. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right, folks. So to wrap up Amendment Eight, before I jump into nine, it's simple. One, if you're suspected, suspected to belong to a gang, and nowhere is it written what it means to show, to prove that you belong to a gang. Does it mean that you were talking to a gang member? Does it mean that you were walking in the wrong side of the road? What does it mean? Your bag is, your, your, your pants is baggy? What does it mean belong to a gang? Nowhere it's written. So you're suspected, you, you're detained. Okay? Number two, kids are affected by this. Because to protect the kids, supposedly they will detain them. Now, where has this been used? We were told that Jamaica used this, they're right. Jamaica used it for a while, while they, and each political part, party will come in, will use it to detain members of the opposition so that when, around election time, so that they won't be able to beat them. All right? And by the way, the PM said it's also used in South Africa. That's correct. It was used in South Africa under apartheid, not under a free South Africa. Okay? So I have done presentations on this from Punta Gorda to Dangriga, in the West, uh, you know, San Ignacio, Belize City, uh, Belmopan, uh, Orange Walk, we've done it on radio in Corzal, uh, in, in um, the Mennonite community in Blue Creek, in um, York Creek. You know, folks, when they understand what this is, they won't take it. So we were able to effectively force the PM to back off. Now the PM claims that he backed off because threat was made to his life. Folks, we've never had a PM threatened before. This is the first time that we know. That's bad. And to me, in my, in my view is, anybody threatened my prime minister's life, that person should be detained. You can't just threaten the prime minister's life and think that that's it. No, you know, this is not just a man. He is the senior rep of the country. Should, that should be respected. Everybody's life has value, but at that position, that, you know, there should be some type of protection. So if that's the case, well, I, 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 I'm, I'm concerned. But I have, a, I, have a, I have a challenge. If this law is good for 312,000 Belizeans, why in God's green earth are we going to back off because one man was threatened? If it is so good for everybody, well then let one, man like, one man's life be threatened. But let all of us be free and preventatively detained, huh? If it's so good. I mean, if you're, if you're sold on this, then whatever happens makes no difference. It's for the best of a nation, not of one man or of one party. But I tell you folks, preventative detention is, such, is trash. It's to be used to politically victimize people. 